we're midstream now, uh, less than two months away from the election. What is life like right now? Is it is it like a controlled chaos? Is it you, every single day there's an event that you have to go to, one or both of you? I mean, just paint a picture for me what life has been like for you guys. Me? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's tough. I mean, it's a, it is a grind. We've been at it a little over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we have 45 days or so to go. Uh, we start pretty early. First thing tends to be about 7.30. Uh, get home usually around 10, sometimes you a little earlier. You usually get home at 10, right. I would think, earliest. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, we and, and work the whole way. I mean, we made a commitment when we got in the race that we wouldn't be outworked. We might not win, but we would not get outworked. And so we've tried to at least live up to that. We mm -hmm. try to steal moments. We did have a chance to take a little vacation to the beach, but for the most part, it's been a, just grinding it out. Yeah. What's it been like for you? I mean, I'm assuming that you're at some of these events, but not always. So to have him always coming home at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And, you know, he's always been really busy. So, I mean, we, we, we make time for each other, but he, there's a lot of stuff that he goes to, and there's a lot of stuff that he's always gone to. And we go to most of it together. If it's an evening event, like if it's a forum or, um, I don't know, a dinner, we'll go together. But during the day, I have to be at work, and, you know, so. It's very hard, though. We don't really get to see each other all that much. What's it been like for you? Um, because you guys worked together on the bus project. You created this pretty amazing movement, really, with the bus project. Thank and, you. Um, you know, motivated a lot of young people to get involved in politics. Um, so you've already been successful in something um, together. So does it feel like this is an extension of that? Like the work that you were doing there is is continuing into a different form? Do you want me to answer that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that Jefferson and I both, we met at the very first bus project meeting and he became the executive director and I was you know, a volunteer, but I think everybody at that point was a volunteer. Nobody was getting paid. Um, but I think we both, you know, I went to that meeting and he sort of called that meeting the, the first bus meeting because we both um, have a pretty strong commitment to um, social justice and getting the community involved. And at that time we were younger, so it was getting young people involved. Um, we still want young people involved in politics, but those were our peers at the time. Mm -hmm. You're still um, young, sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's so nice. Um, You've just been young longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I guess this is, and his, his, uh, his campaign is an extension of some of the same reasons why we started the BUS project in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, I guess I would ask them, what's different? about your campaign versus the ideals that you were striving for with the Bruss Project? Oh, I mean, for one, we're older, and that's not just semantic. I mean, we were kids when we started, mm -hmm. and we had a lot to learn. And Katie had a job, and we weren't romantically involved then, right? So we, we didn't get, uh, we didn't start dating until, oh, uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. We got married three years ago. Uh, so partly, it's different because now we're doing it together as a couple. That's true, right? And when we were doing the bus, we weren't doing it together as a couple. Uh, so that's one difference. The other is uh, running a nonprofit organization has some similarities with any leadership enterprise, from running a company to being an executive of in, a, in the public sector. But there's also differences, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to, you don't have a obvious and steady stream, predictable stream of money coming publicly, right? The bus ran without any government money, so we had to go out and beat the bushes for the resources and volunteers we gathered. Uh, and, uh, and government has some differences. The combination of the, of the bus and serving the legislature, I guess there's some overlap. Probably the biggest is just a commitment to service and trying to continue to serve and work hard and try to maintain some sanity and relationship as we go along. That can be tough. I mean, you know, to be in a relationship with somebody who's incredibly busy, what is it like to be married to Jefferson? It's fun. It's wonderful. He's my best friend. He's the funniest person that I've ever met in my whole life. Um, You're the funniest person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> um, those are the things, I mean, it's, 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 it's like being married to your best friend, a very, you know, in incredibly smart person who is talented and hilarious. Right now it's a little more difficult because um, obviously we don't get to see each other as much as we used to, but um, 
for me, the hardest part is sort of hearing some of the stories or you know, reading online comments, which I should never do. Don't do it. <laughs> um, because I know who he is, and I know that a lot of the stories out there just they don't ring true at all. So, um, you mentioned the trip that you took to the beach. Mm -hmm. That trip came on the heels of you know this big thing about your driving record. Sure. And so uh, I guess I I don't really know what to ask about that. You've addressed it pretty fully. Yeah. Um, but now that some time has gone by, mm -hmm. what have you learned from that experience? And well, was the trip to the beach planned, or was it sort of a no? The, it, it, it's, it's, it's been Whitney? no. It was it, it was planned for a long time, and the, the hard decision was whether to keep the vacation or stay. Mm -hmm. And the and there was a piece of both of us who who uh, that was saying, "Hey, listen, yeah, this has been public information for a long time, and I've had two moving violations in the last eight years, and I had an atrocious college driving record. Mm -hmm. I had a really bad driving record between 2002 and 2004. It's something I'm embarrassed about, and I should." Uh, be here and a answer whatever question they wanted. Uh, what we decided, though, is that we didn't take that those five and a half days. That was literally the only window that we were going to take to have any time together right. between then and the election. Uh, so tried to uh, try to answer it as best as we could before we left. Uh, and uh, the the Oregonian decided to continue to discuss it <laughs> after after our departure. Things I've learned go deeper than my driving record. Right. I mean, for a while, uh, as we've been, not just running for mayor, but for the last 10 years, trying to figure out how to better manage my, my own sort of overall health, try to be, uh, as I'm getting really focused on the work that I'm doing, making sure I'm just managing my own personal life in a reasonable, responsible way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's something that I... Uh, probably took for granted for a long time. I'd always been pretty physically fit, for instance. I gained a bunch of weight, I was out of shape. So I've tried, one of the things that we've tried, and Katie's actually been really helpful uh, since we got married, is trying, you know, I've lost 15 pounds, I'm, uh, I'm trying to take my, uh, my vitamins, my medication, trying to work out a little bit, trying to have a more regular sleep-wake schedule, and just sort of manage myself better, even as I am focused on work a bunch. So that's been, um, that's one of the lessons. You mentioned medication. I mean, it's been reported. Sure. You're, you're ADD. I yeah. Mean, so that's a challenge in itself yeah. to be able to focus, even to have a conversation sure. and not go off on tangents. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, is that something that you've actively worked on? I, I've, certain things have been harder for me my whole life. You know, when I was in first grade, I thought I was the dumbest kid in my class. You know, I had a hard time finishing my work. Some things were always harder, and I worked at it, you know, and and in uh, and ended up, you know, not only graduating from high school and college, but ended up graduating near the top of my class at Harvard Law School. Started and ran a successful nonprofit organization. Was elected and reelected to House leadership in the legislature, and now participating in one of the strongest grassroots campaigns in the history of the city. And uh, I recognize that with some of my weaknesses have also come some strengths. And have tried to uh, tried to minimize my weaknesses and address them, um, and also make best use of my strengths. It's a very vulnerable place to be in to run for political office. I mean, if the door is opened, every weakness is exposed. I I could never do it. I mean, most that's why most people don't do it these days is because so many aspects of your life are scrutinized, and I mm -hmm. can't imagine the pressure that that entails. I mean, you talked about you know, the stuff that's reported and then the stuff that people say online. When you read about people um, talking about his temper and, you know, the basketball incident and the soccer game, how does that sit with you? How do you react as his wife when you read about those incidents? Well, I mean, like you said, it sort of goes with the territory. You know, it's politics. Um, people are going to say stuff that, I, that just isn't true. So I try to... Um, get used to it and, and, and not react. But, um, you know, I, it's hurtful. It really is. But he chose to run for political office, so, you know, you, you have to take the hits. Does he have a temper? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. He's the most loving person that I've ever met. But he's competitive, which I think may have led to some of the things that were discussed. Um, he is competitive, yeah. I'm not competitive, so it's hard for me to relate. But um, 
yeah, he... Uh, yeah, you're competitive. Mm -hmm. Do you think, Jefferson, that um, because you came into this campaign with so much success at a er relatively early age, you're what, you're 38 now, right? Just turned 39. Just turned 39, okay. So, I mean, in your 39 years, you've accomplished a lot politically, a lot more than a lot of people have in 39. Um, but there is still, you know, especially because your opponent is Charlie Hales, he's older than you, he's been, you know, on the city council before, he has a different persona than you. Sure. And I'm sure that his people would love nothing more than to label you as, you know, the young kid on the block who doesn't know what he's doing. Right. So these incidents that have come up and been reported have not helped to counter that notion. How does that, how do you fight that? Well, hopefully the answer isn't fighting someone else's attacks. Hopefully the answer is focusing on what the city needs to do. And that ultimately this race isn't about Charlie and it's not about me. This is about the people of Portland. It's about the future of the city. And if we can have the focus on that, then not only is that the conversation that we should be having, and not only does that put us in a better position to lead and do good things for the city, and listen to my puppy in the background whine, uh, but it also um, is also the conversation that I think we're best suited for. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been pretty well reported about flaws of recent politicians. What we've learned over the last 30 years with the internet age, with lots more television channels, with many more reporters wanting to get stories, mm -hmm. what we're learning more and more is that we elect human beings because that's all we have to choose from. Mm -hmm. and, the, and what I've tried to be clear about is that I'm a human being, and I'm a flawed human being. I've made mistakes before I was running for mayor, while I was running for mayor, when I was a kid, and try to be the best person I can be and try to be the best leader I can be. And if people evaluate that, strengths and weaknesses, decide they want somebody else to be their mayor, that's a legitimate choice. And I think I have something to offer the city, and I just try to be as candid as I can be about that. I want to get to what you have to offer in just a second, sure. and, I, and I promise not to harp on this, but it's a question that has been sitting with me for a while because I read the reports and I'm like, okay, what, what now what's coming out? And the question that crosses my mind is, you know, if, if you knew fairly early on that you wanted to go into a career in politics or you knew that this was perhaps on the horizon, mm -hmm. What troubles me then becomes a question of judgment. If you know that your goal is to enter politics, then my question is about the behavior that you engaged in on the basketball court mm -hmm. or on a soccer field that in the back of my mind you had to know at some point down the line might come up the mm -hmm. way that politics works. Mm -hmm. So is there a question there of judgment on your part and will that affect how you run the city? Oh, I think what happens on the basketball court is very different what happens in the city. and. Uh, and there's been enough conversation about the 17 second incident when I've been knocked on the ground uh, and stayed on the ground and didn't get up to have an altercation. There's probably been enough conversation about that. I think that uh, my legislative record, I think my record as an organizational leader uh, is one that has been one of working really hard, uh, bringing a lot of people together, of being a bridge builder, you know, maybe not the Columbia River crossing, but you know, generally trying to be someone who brings people together and builds bridges. And I hope that's the kind of mayor that we'll have, and I hope that's the kind of mayor I'll be. Um, Katie, for you, what is it like for you uh, in, in this process as you prepare in your mind, you know, if Jefferson is elected and you become essentially, you know, the first lady of Portland, um, what have you thought much about what that role will look like for you? Does any does much change for you in terms of your daily life and and what your plans would be? I haven't really thought much about it, but I will say that if he is elected, um, you know, one thing that I am most concerned about because um, where we live right now in East Portland is also the neighborhood that I grew up in, and it has changed an awful lot um, over the last 37 years. I was, I'm 37. Um, <gasps> see, funny. Um, so, you know, if he is elected, Portland will have, you know, its first mayor who lives east of 82nd Avenue. 
And I know that's just something that you know people say, but it actually, I, I think personally, it's really important um, to have the mayor actually wake up and walk outside, take the dog for a walk in a neighborhood that has such high crime rates. Um, and in a school district where, you know, David Douglas High School, the kids are, it's 80% free and reduced price lunch. And at the, the grade school that I went to, Lincoln Park grade school, um, it's 100%. Because at a certain point when it goes up so high, they just round it up to 100%. Mm. So, um, you know, I don't know what my, you know, I haven't really thought about what my role would be. We, we, we're not going to move out of the area that we live in. Um, we like it here. But we also just think that it's really important to shine a light um, on just, it's not that there are two Portlands right now, but I think a lot of people who live closer in or even on the west side, they hear these stories about East Portland and you know how bad it is out here. But to actually live here, um, to have a mayor who actually lives here, I think would be just uh, great for the city. And, and if crime happens anywhere in one part of the city or if po poverty happens anywhere, it affects the whole city. So that's the thing that I'm really most concerned about. Your decision to move into this neighborhood mm -hmm. came relatively soon before you decided to run mm -hmm. as a representative of this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I think there was maybe this perception at the time that you were, forgive the term, carpet bagging, mm -hmm. but moving into the neighborhood for that purpose. Was mm -hmm. that part of a master plan? I, I would overstate to say we've had a, much of a master plan. <laughs> but the, uh, but the but yeah, I wanted to run for the legislature, and one of the things we considered when we were looking for a house was that. We were living at the time, also had a, an open legislative seat, so a couple other factors ended up being probably a little more important. One was this was really close to Katie's sister and close to where Katie had grown up, and also it was a house we could afford. Right? When we were renting before, you know, I've been operating as a nonprofit head, and, then, uh, and the legislature doesn't pay very much either, and so you know, we have a relatively humble house, and here was a place that had an affordable house for sale. So there are a few factors when we made our decision. You talked about some of the things that are your strengths. Mm -hmm. um, what, and I guess. I don't think I did actually. Or, or, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you asked me, and I don't think I said anything. But that's okay. No, you mentioned I mentioned it. I had some. Right, some. <laughs> but I think that's as far as I went. And I promise you I would come back to that. Um, so I guess projecting ahead, let's say you are elected. Let's say you know you serve as Portland's mayor for the next four years. What will be the legacy that you leave as four years as our leader for four years? It's a good question, but I want to come back to something that we were talking about before. Uh, that when you asked Katie about what it's like to do this, mm. and the and you're really nice about it, um, but it's been hard. And part of the challenge I've now seen that I appreciate more in this race, uh, which has been, the, by almost every measurable indication, the toughest municipal election in the history of our city by you know, number of doors, number of dollars, number of stories, number of anything you can count, is that the, uh, is for a political spouse, you don't have as much recourse. When uh, somebody says something nasty about me, I take responsibility, I apologize, I try to get better, and I show up to work the next day, and I try to do my best. For Katie, all she can say is, uh, Jeff, don't embarrass the family. <laughs> right? She doesn't have the same, you know, one definition of stress is fight or flight without recourse. And I have a deeper appreciation of the challenge of being a political spouse uh, from being a part of this election. I would imagine it is challenging. I mean, when the report comes out, that's a hard conversation to have with Jefferson, I'm sure. If Whether you knew about the incidents, did you know about these incidents before they, they were reported? I knew, I know everything about him. He's okay. my best friend. Okay. So, um, so it's not like... <laughs> and, and by the way, you yeah. know, this the, his driving record was public before he decided to run for mayor, and it was talked about in the primary, too. It's just keeps being talked about, which is, you know, it comes with the territory. Um, but one thing, you know, it, yeah, it's hard, but we have each other to talk to and lean on, which is great. Um, we have good families and friends, so that's also great. Um, one, th one thing that I am very, very proud of him for so far in this race, two things actually, but the first one is just 
um, you know, if anything has come up about something personal in his life like that, and he's asked about it, he has been 100% honest, you know, from the get-go. Very proud of him for that. But I would expect no less. So. What was the other thing? Uh, well, I was going to, and I guess we could talk about it later, but maybe it doesn't really fit in this part, but um, just his, uh, the way he's ran his campaign. Um, he made an all, was it all positive pledge? I don't know exactly how it said. 100% positive. Um, the day that he announced that he was running for mayor at his kickoff, at his big kickoff, mm -hmm. he, um, I guess that wasn't the day you announced, but at your kickoff, um, I think the biggest applause line that he got from the crowd that was there was when he said that he would not hire any, what are they called? Opposition, opposition researchers. Opposition researchers. Um, so I think Portland just really appreciates, and you know, it's it's a very Portland thing to have a positive campaign, meaning you know, no negative ads, no opposition research. So that's the other thing that I'm very proud of him for. And you continue to maintain that, I mean, you'll, you will through November. Yeah, we'll have disagreements, but we made a pledge that we weren't gonna buy polls. I mean, the typical way that campaigns get run mm -hmm. is you hire a leading consultant, you pay them a bunch of money, you raise a bunch of money to pay them and then to run some polls. Uh, and to hire an opposition researcher. You buy the polls, so you tell people in TV land what they want to hear, and you find that out through the poll, and you hire the opposition researcher to figure out how to burn your opponent to the ground. Right, either, to see what will be effective. Yeah, either because either either you do it yourself or because you feed it to somebody else, reporter or whatever. The challenge, I see, I see that, right? I've been watching politics sure. for a while. Uh, and. I don't, I'm not so naive as to think it's not effective if the definition of effectiveness is winning elections or causing someone else to lose elections. I just don't think it's doing very much for our democracy. I don't think it's giving voters, giving human beings, giving cities, giving the world, giving the country uh, very good results. We end up having political campaign conversations that aren't closely enough linked to what we want to accomplish, to what we want to do, to bringing the city together, to giving people confidence in the public thing. Everybody turns their TV off and say, ah, politicians, they're all lousy. Why should I do anything? I can stay here and not do anything to participate in my city. Mm -hmm. If we want to re-engage people, understand that we get the government we deserve and we need to all work to deserve better, then we've got to run our kind of campaign, the kind of campaigns that reflect our values and reflect the kind of people and place we want to be. Back to the question about legacy then. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's say four years from now you are uh, finishing out your term yeah. as mayor of Portland. What will you have accomplished in four years? I hope my legacy won't be thought of as something about me. My, uh, my favorite story of Portland is the story of Waterfront Park, which is supposed to be a freeway. And the reason it's not a freeway is not merely because of some benevolent politician, but because of people in the city, and a woman named Allison Belcher who would host, started hosting picnics and ladies' teas on the side of that road with a sign that said, imagine if this were a park, and now it's a park. That if, after four years, we're getting the city working better for more people, which is what we've been talking about since essentially the beginning of the campaign, reducing unemployment, improving satisfaction with government services in 2010, I think it was 49%, I'd like to see to get that up to 60%. And also getting the city working for more people, seeing the whole city, recognizing if you gentrify one portion of town, fail to invest in another, invest in urban renewal districts or bridge boondoggles or tax breaks, and fail to invest in services and after school and summer programs, the kinds of things that prove education results, the kind of things that make neighborhoods safer, uh, we don't get the city we want to be for anybody in the city. Mm -hmm. So if we can get the city working better for more people, but then have the spotlight not on a particular elected official, but on human beings that did marvelous, innovative things in our economy. People who solved problems in government to make things operate a little better, a little more cheaply. And heroes and heroines who help educate and raise young people and advocate for the whole city. I'll feel that that was a good expenditure of a life. What is your best idea for how to get the city working? Uh, Working as in getting people jobs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, I'd say two things in particular. And every politician runs on jobs. I don't know, I, you know, for 10 years right. I've been paying attention. I, haven't, I think every politician I've ever watched runs on jobs. The political promise 
that I've made that I want to make again, it's the one about which I have the greatest confidence, is that as mayor of Portland, Oregon, I will not turn around the global economy. <laughs> uh, and if it happens, I will not perform a victory lap proclaiming, in fact, it was I that did so. The under over the <laughs> <water>. <laughs> the, There are a couple of things, there are a couple of things, or at least obvious candor. There are a couple of things I think we can do better. One, we can make infrastructure investments more smartly. The, right now, there's a lot of conversation about a give or take $4 billion highway interchange project to Clark County. It's pitched as a jobs plan. It isn't one, unless what we're talking about is the jobs for the consultants and planners and lobbyists who've been trying to build the project, and the jobs that are going to be moved over to Clark County if we build it while we fail to invest in other things and fail to lobby for other things like getting, out of, getting money out of the Pentagon to clean up the Willamette River, like trying to build a broadband network, like trying to get honest to goodness, at least predictable rail uh, north and south, that infrastructure investments that fit our city and fit this century. That's one thing we need to do better. Second, shifting some of our attention from just trying to attract out-of-state businesses, which is important, but particularly to see how we can grow and cultivate early-stage homegrown businesses. So often we hear from, sorry, sweetheart, okay. uh, from a, um, from a, uh, yeah. So often we hear from, uh, you know, on the radio, from a person in the media, from a politician, uh, you know, we could attract more business to Oregon, we could attract more companies to Portland if we would just do blank. Much less often do we hear, you know, we could grow more companies in Portland, we could grow more businesses in Oregon if we would just do blank. It's a huge mistake in our common conversation because where job growth has come from has not been from non-resident, larger scale, later stage employers. Nearly all net job growth has come from earlier stage, homegrown, uh, tend to be smaller employers. Not just economic hunting, but economic gardening. We could do that way better. Harvard Kennedy School named it one of the top 25 recent government innovations. Looking at how we can help small businesses with CEO mentorship, with better circulation of, cap of local capital, and helping homegrown businesses find access to new customers and new markets. Helping companies like Indo Windows get access to GIS mapping and weather pattern information so they can figure out where to sell their removable storm window before next, win uh, next winter. Right? Helping homegrown businesses grow is another thing we can do really well. Which and then beyond that. You're probably right, I should mm -hmm. mention What you won the Small Business Champion Award for? I did. Mm -hmm. He's very humble. <laughs> I, I did. In fact, it's over there. We have the award over there. <laughs> yeah, I know. We should go get it. Uh, the uh, hold it up. It's like Tracy Flick would do. No uh, beyond, yeah, it, it's. Um, we did some humble work and received a little bit of rec recognition for it. Uh, beyond that, it's workforce and making sure the city works. I mean, the big, most important thing that a mayor, that a city does for job development is keeping this and making this a great city. Mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm not going to be the uh, primary innovator of every economic accomplishment we have. My primary job is to make sure that we set the table so that lots of people can do great things and that smart people, that creative people, that hardworking people, that every regular person who wants to give it their best be the kind of place they want to live. When um, I look at your campaign donors, I mean, you have a lot of them posted on your website, but just looking at your top you know, 10 or 15 campaign donors, um, there's, of course, several unions in there. There's the, the Teachers Union, um, the Police Association, and the Firefighters Association. What does that say about you, that you have the support of these unions? And how beholden are you to their interests once you become mayor? Hopefully what I am beholden to is the public interest. Hopefully what I'm beholden to are the voters of Portland. And we're running our campaign in a way that will hopefully make that more obvious. Right? Mm -hmm. We've we have now have over 3,500 individual donors, which I think is more than any campaign in the history of the city. There is no donor to us that's a very huge share of our race. Uh, no, your biggest donor is actually miscellaneous donors under, what, $100, right? Yeah. Contributors who've given less than 100 have given you about $165,000. Yeah. And That's your biggest contributor. Right. So. And so, so what we've hoped to do, we've done 179 neighborhood house parties. We're hoping to do another 30 or 40 more, trying to build a historic grassroots campaign because the way we run for office is linked to how we govern. Mm -hmm. 
if what we do is merely shop around for large campaign contributions, use that to pay for opposition research and polls and rehab the same kind of conversations we've been having, we're not going to get much better results. So I'm proud to have support of police and firefighters mm -hmm. and teachers and environmentalists and the independent yeah, party yeah. and Mother PAC and lots of elected officials and lots of business leaders and lots of nonprofit advocates. Uh, but ultimately, the core of our campaign uh, has been pretty regular human beings in Portland. Mm -hmm. right? When I got in this race, most folks said I didn't have a chance and told Katie and I both that, that we didn't have much of a chance. And so a lot of the power in the city wasn't trying to cuddle up to us and sort of say, hey, here, how can we help because you're going to be the next mayor? So we have tried to build our campaign from the ground up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been built around knocking on over 60,000 doors, building a pretty big social media footprint, having over 3,500 donors and doing Winters. upwards yeah, of, of 200 house parties, and we'll clear that hopefully pretty soon. Is Paul Rudd the actor? No, he's not. He's a different guy. That'd be okay. cool, though. <laughs> it was an L.A. address, so it was like, oh, dear, Paul Rudd. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We've only been over right to over. his house for dinner like three times, <laughs> so we don't know him that well, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, I read somewhere that one of your favorite shows is The Wire. <laughs> yes, not one of. It's, your favorite. It's, that's it, like that's... Oh, I, b I believe The Wire is one of the most important artistic expressions of the last 50 years. Be careful here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be careful. Well, I mean, we're huge fans too. At our I'm a big Wire so. fan. How much are you like Tom Garcetti? Carcetti. 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 Oh. <laughs> Carcetti, you're right. The, uh, uh, Hopefully not very much. He is a, he is a fictional character, <laughs> and, uh, and I do not view The Wire as a how-to video for how to conduct business of a city. I do find I it to be not. entertainment. <laughs> right. Um, what has surprised you about Jefferson in this campaign process? Uh, that's a good question. I really have not been surprised by anything because I guess we know each other so well. I, you know, I knew that he would run his campaign the way he's run it. Um, I knew he would run a grassroots campaign with volunteers from, you know, all over Oregon. Um, I guess I didn't think of that would be a question, but I can't imagine, nothing. Nothing's really surprised me. What yeah. has surprised you about yourself in this process? If anything. Uh, the, I don't know, I tend not, it's a hard question, isn't it? It is kind yeah. of. And, and when, when, we, when we first got into the legislature, you know, and, we, and when I served, started serving my first term in the legislature, I got asked a question similar to that, right? What's surprising to you about being in the legislature? And I said, I didn't formulate, right. I didn't spend energy in formulating clear expectations, right? right? What right. I try to do is take it as it comes and do my best. And so the energy I put in is not to predict, mm -hmm. but to work. Uh, the, there are a couple of things. Had somebody said that for the four months leading into the primary, uh, you would work 14-hour days, probably a little better on that on average, but you know, maybe 14-hour days on average, and you would take in those four months one day off a month, right? So go you know, doing 100-hour weeks, and, and you would continue to do that, and not merely showing up to work to do that, but along the way, having something that in my normal life, you know, every day something that would have been the biggest thing in a week, every week having something that would have been the biggest thing in a month, having in uh, every month having multiple things would have been the biggest thing I did in a year. So, and still be able to function, still have my mind work, still stay focused. Uh, the, uh, I would have told them, no, no, I'm gonna need more time off than that. I'm gonna have a better, I'm gonna have a greater fall off in terms of my own productivity and capacity. Uh, so, I guess I'm pleasantly surprised that we made it through, put in that kind of hours, those kind of hours, right. and still function pretty well. I guess well. that's the right answer. It's just that you, you can't believe how much you can not put up with, but um, physically, emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I knew he was he was strong and, and could handle it, but I guess there's just it's it's been a little bit harder than I think that we thought. Yeah, yeah. I, and that's the and, and so it's the the question was what has surprised me or you about mm -hmm. you? So. Yeah. I guess my only answer really is nothing because I already knew how strong and dedicated he was, but the surprising thing about actually running are all of those things. It's yeah. the stamina that it takes. Yeah, to actually it really does. 
Um, is he punctual for you when he says he's going to be somewhere? Oh, yes. Yeah. He's on time. That's not true. I mean, <laughs> yes, it, I mean, I, I guess, so are you asking, because we never really meet each other places. So, you know, I don't, we go places together. Right. So he's punctual for me because we're always together because I get him out the door. You know, but, yeah, okay. yeah, we never really. No, we do all right. We do all right. I, I get ready pretty fast. <laughs> what is he like as a husband? When you ask him to do something, do you have to nag him to do it and to get it done? No, um, I don't have to nag you to. Well, occasionally, if there's depends something. on the thing. I yeah, guess. Lawn he did. He lawn mowing. Actually, the the day that the Olympics started, I was I had to go into work. It was a Saturday, I think. So it was maybe it wasn't the day the Olympics started, but it was the day that um, the gymnastics competition started. Yes. And I really can't figure out the DVR very well. And I was sitting at my desk. It was beautiful outside. And I got a text. And I looked down. And he said, mowed the lawn, set the DVR for two gymnastics competitions. I don't know which one you wanted to watch, but I, I DVR both of them. It was the most romantic thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he does, I, that was without even being prompted. He just, yeah. I was thinking one day we might get interviewed. Yeah, you know, we have to tell a story. Oh, and he also yeah. mowed a, a heart into the lawn when I got home. There was a heart that he had mowed out. Very sweet. The remnants of that are actually are they? outside, apparently. Aww. Can you see? Yeah. Never mow it again. Love you. <laughs> um, anything else you guys wanted to share that I haven't been smart enough to ask mm. you? Yeah, you didn't ask me what surprised me about Katie. Oh, what has surprised Stop. you about Katie in this process? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm allowed to say. And if I say something you don't want me to say, then you can, you can shut me well, off. Well, then maybe you don't <laughs> say anything. I'm getting nervous. No, uh, that the, uh, this is hard on anybody. It's, I think it's hard particularly for political spouses. And the, um, and Katie, you know, is not as sort of a public person as I am, a little shyer, uh, but has been a champ, right? I mean, that, that, that if I had known, I mean, you don't, you don't know every, you don't fully appreciate all the mistakes you've made in your life <sighs> until you see them on the front page of the newspaper, right? And, and, because, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and it's, and it's, and it's fair for people to know who I am. I think there's some question about what level of detail they need to know about our lives and about every mistake I've made, but to understand that, uh, that I'm, I have imperfections and that's the kind of leader I'll be as an imperfect leader, but one who works really hard, that tries to take in information really well, and that's fair. What I also would, wouldn't have fully appreciated, wouldn't have guessed very well is, okay, once you put all that, you know, once you go through everything we've been going through, and there's other people who've gone through worse. I mean, you know, they're talking about a driving record and a couple other things, but you know, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the, on the spectrum of, you know, uh, political yeah, it, people making oh, blunders. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, um, but what surprised me about Katie over the last year is I knew she was tough. And I knew she was smart. Uh, the, I don't use this word, but sort of the grace and ability to keep at this for now over a year. Uh, I wouldn't have fully appreciated the need to do that, or sort of your your how good you are at you know how, how well you've done. So that's been a surprise. Oh, I love you. What has she said to you on those days? Like when that article comes out and you are exposed in that way, mm -hmm. what is that conversation like? I mean, should I, we just uh, roll? Do you want us uh, to role play it? Right yeah. Now? <laughs> well, because I would imagine myself in that position. Like, there would be part of me if I were your spouse. Like, I would be pissed at you. I would be mm. like, Oh my God, why did you behave in this way? Or I know. Was it a source of contention? I think or? you would be surprised because you feel like it's something. It's it's. I wouldn't call it an attack, but you feel like it's happening to your family. Mm. So you've, you, instead of feeling, you know, anything about Jeff toward Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, Mostly you just sort of feel protective and you mm -hmm. want to um, sort of lift the other person up, say, you know, you're going to be, we're going to get through this. So it, it is kind of a surprising feeling. And it, it's a feeling of being totally and completely out of control and not being able, you know, to control what other people are saying. It's very difficult. Was there, uh, were there things in particular that Katie said to you on those days that have been helpful? 
that you remember? Uh, yeah, and, and I, um, I remember a few things in some particular days. One of the days was when, in the primary, a poll came out showing that, you know, I was in deep third place <laughs> and reinforcing uh, what uh, some of the powerful folks in the city were saying, which is, you know, this guy doesn't have much of a chance. You don't have to worry about him. And we did a house party uh, and hosted by some friends. And, and somebody asked me, what does it feel like to be the underdog? <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, I answered that question. And then afterwards, we were driving home, and I must have looked a little bit down. And, uh, and Katie said um, something like, I think I'm allowed to say this. Uh, we'll see. She didn't believe it if she was. You, you know, say screw it. Another word for that, I think. Probably. Okay, well, well, maybe I'll say it to in two ways, and she could pick which one. Uh, the, I, she'll decide what she's allowed to hear. I think the FCC will pick which one. Well, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, I must look kind of down. We were driving home, and, and Katie said, screw it. Uh, just work your ass off and tell the truth. And it's the most, the smartest thing that's been said on the campaign. And after that, we tried to be a little clearer about how I, not only what I think, but how I'm thinking it, about why I think the Columbia River Crossing is a big mistake, why I think our economic development future is not primarily aided by a strategy of tax breaks and reducing fees for developers. Um, what are the smartest things we can do for education while not trying to overstate it and say that the mayor runs schools because the mayor doesn't run schools. Mm -hmm. And that after that, uh, you know, somebody came up and asked, uh, at another house party, somebody said, oh, so you're the politician that's not full of blank, and I won't <laughs> say that word. And I said, no, I'm the politician that's partially full of blank. But my willingness to acknowledge that means that grading on a curve, I'm, I'm pretty good. You're not full of blank, though. Thank you, sweetheart. You're not. You're not. Uh, so anyway. Is he, uh, what, the question that I think sometimes comes back to people, and it may have to do with your age, it may have to do with some of the stuff that's come out, but is he grown up enough to be Portland's mayor? Well, I mean, Jefferson, you, he's serving out his second term in the state legislature. He um, was elected twice to House leadership by his peers. He's passed, I think, the biggest water bill that's ever come out um, of the legislature in Oregon's history. Yeah. Built co okay, well then I overstated it, but um, you know, built coalitions in the state legislature, ran um, in an Oregon the Oregon Bus Project, an organization where, with, you know, he had to meet a payroll, he had employees. Um, so he's absolutely, I, I think he's, he's grown up enough to be mayor. Um, he's, he's silly, but in a fun way, you know. He, he, he's fun, and he's funny, and he's silly. He does cartwheels and parades, but he, um, he also, you know, he's, he's a state representative who's on house leadership, who's done some amazing work, so yes. Are you grown up enough to be mayor? And do you resent that question? Oh, people can ask me whatever <laughs> they want. Uh, I'm going to be 40. <laughs> uh, I won't be the youngest mayor the city's ever had by any stretch. Uh, what I know, we've talked some about things I need to get better at. We haven't talked much about some of the things I'm good at. Uh, I, I work really hard. Right? I, work harder than, I work harder than most people I know. Uh, I process information very well. I have a pretty good ability to see the forest and the trees and zoom back and forth mm. between them and understand how things work together. Uh, I care a lot about what we're doing. I care a lot about the city uh, and work pretty hard to be disciplined about the things that we're trying to accomplish. And that's how we've done what we've done over the last decade plus and what I hope we'll do for another four years or whatever is mayor and if I don't win what I hope I'll do whatever I do is just focus on what we're going to try to accomplish and put everything I have into it. Was that a yes? You don't even remember the question. Uh, yes, you're grown up enough to be mayor. If, if, <laughs> if uh, I've grown up enough to be mayor, but it's the primary question is not, it's not a matter of gr upness or growingness. <laughs> it's a matter of can we accomplish what needs to get done? And can we put in the kind of work? Can we gather the team that's necessary? 
Can we demonstrate the discipline to the budget that we need? And for those things, yeah. I hope I I'll always have fun. I hope I'll always entertain kids. I hope I'll always uh, be silly with my wife. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but I wouldn't have run if I think I'd vote for myself. And I wouldn't have voted for myself if I didn't think I had reached the place in my life where, uh, where I can do really helpful things for people. I guess to ask in a different way, are you organized and responsible enough to be essentially a head manager for the city? Because mm -hmm. that, that role as mayor winds up being kind of mm -hmm. the CEO of the city in, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. It's not so, I think it, everybody looks at it differently. You know, everybody right. says, oh, it's visionary. But really, on a daily basis, it can be kind of just a grind of mm -hmm. managing people and resources mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. listening to people complain at city council mm -hmm. meetings. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess it, it speaks more to the question of are you organized and responsible enough in your personal and professional life to take on this role? Yes. <sighs> I think it goes back to you, you know, having started and ran a nonprofit already yeah. you know you've you have the already have the experience yeah. of doing I'm, that I'm not I'm not falling up off a turnip track I went to preschool <laughs> yesterday right? Right, I mean, but it, I mean it's you know no, like with the nonprofit there was yeah, there were fines from the Secretary of State's office yeah about the same number kind of about the same number as with other similarly situated nonprofits right. the uh, the uh, but I think we grew every two years by double we're mm -hmm. fast growing very successful nationally recognized nonprofit it started as all volunteer, and yeah, certainly made mistakes. As, I mean, we were kids and we started it, and wasn't anybody getting paid living wage when we started. I was mm -hmm. working for free, and so were um, a lot of the participants until we started growing. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, we doubled every year, and I don't think we had a single year where we missed budget projections by 5%. It was pretty rare. Early on, because we couldn't pay, we had high turnover in staff. By the time I was done, we had one of the longer average uh, staff durations of most similarly situated nonprofits. Uh, that the that now you, you look at the legislature we passed our priority bills we set them in the goal areas we had and then we work to pass them uh, and in the campaign I think I'm the only candidate in the race who didn't finish the primary with a lot of debt mm -hmm. we work to be pretty careful particularly with other people's money mm -hmm. and that's a something that I, that's something that's been true not only in the last yesterday or the last year, but something we've worked at for you know, the last yeah. decade and had some success with.